you get your Bibles open this morning to Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, we're going to be touching on a theme today that, um, that we're going to probably see several times as we get into the, the latter part of the gospel, greatness in God's kingdom, what it means to be great in the kingdom of God. And um, so this will be our first time we touched on that and many more to come. And with that being said, I'd like to introduce it um, with almost like a secondary teaching today. So the introduction is a little bit long, but the sermon is a little bit shorter, so everybody will be fine with that. I want to talk about worldview getting into this passage today. And I think you'll understand the connection between those two thoughts, the idea of being great in the kingdom of God and a worldview. Um, I, I would imagine there's probably Yahtzee. How many of you young people have been to like Worldview Academy or something like that? So I probably need to invite you all to come up here and handle this for me rather than me do it myself. But a worldview basically is the way we perceive reality. Um, it's the way we make sense of all that's around us. And our worldview will also guide us in our decision-making processes. To, to determine your own worldview, um, and there's quite a few different ways you can do this, but, and you can do this with others as well, I suggest a few basic questions to determine your basic worldview. The first one is this, is there something other than the material realm? Is there something other than what we see? This is the question about God. Is there a God, and if so, who is this unseen being? How am I doing so far, young people, for Worldview Academies? Am I doing all right on track? Number two, what am I? And you'll notice I didn't say who am I, but rather what am I? This is the question about humanity. Is man just another creature of haphazard mutations or something special? Is he indeed a result of the creator? And as, as for me as an individual, am I unique? Um, as a human, am I special? Am I distinct? Then there are questions about life and death. Does my life have a meaning? Does it have a purpose? Um, and what happens when I die? Questions about ethics. How do I determine what's right or wrong? Are there absolutes or only shifting opinions that determine societal rules and regulations? And then questions about history. Does it matter what has happened in the past? Again, is there a purpose or a plan to history or just random cycles of nonsensical molecules colliding into one another? With that being said, um, if you go online and look up a list of worldviews, you might find a list of three, five, seven, eight, or even more. There's probably more worldviews than we can come up with. Um, just a couple to, to think about. The secular humanist worldview, they would tend to be materialistic. That is to say, the only thing that exists is what we see. And so do the best you can do because this is all there is. There is the worldview that's associated with the Far East. And the Far East is kind of interesting because it would be pantheistic. Everything is God. And in that worldview, nothing really is going anywhere. Um, the pantheistic worldview or the Far East worldview is that there's like this central idea and everything kind of moves out and back to it. And New Age music is also like that. It really doesn't go anywhere. It's kind of just like an oscillating tool that seems like it's in motion but goes nowhere. Then for our world today, at least in, in Western civilization, we're past the uh, postmodern, we're past the neo-modern, we're into the pseudo-modern or the globalization worldview. Now, there could be two extremes as it relates to God with these worldviews. It could either be the atheistic, that there is no God, or the polytheistic, that there's lots of gods. And it could even be nihilistic, which means nothing, which means that your life is meaningless. Or believe it or not, that everything is just an illusion. Has anyone here ever met an individual who thought that there was nothing at all, it was just all an illusion? Ever met anybody like that? Years ago, I did, when we were doing a thing over at the, uh, one of the bookstores, I don't remember what it was called nowadays. I don't think bookstores exist anymore. It's all online, right? But we were doing like a, uh, an apologetics in this particular bookstore, and I was challenging people on these thoughts, and someone said, it's just all an illusion. And I said, well, I would challenge you then to, um, the first thing I said is then take off all your clothes. <laughs> but I changed it quickly, because they seemed like they were willing to do that. I said, I challenge you to go out on 64 and stand in oncoming traffic. And this young lady said that she was willing to do that. I think she was trying to make a point, but um, by the way, I wouldn't recommend anyone do that, just so you know, it wouldn't work out very well. Then there's the fundamentalist worldview. And fundamentalists don't think of just Christianity. Pretty much every religion has a group that are known as the fundamentalist of their religion. They believe 
their sacred writings. They believe that they're significant and important. And they will tend to either be deistic or theistic. Deistic, believing there is a God, but he's not involved. Or theistic, he's involved in some varying degree. Now, as a Christian, you would probably say, I have a Christian worldview or a biblical worldview. Um, and I, I would say that there are five things that you should readily affirm. And I hope you give an amen to at least one or two of these. How's that sound? Number one, you know that not only is there a God, but you know the God, the one true God. Can I get an amen on that? Not only do you understand there isn't a, a supreme being out there, but you know this one true God. Number two, Imago Dei. You affirm that all people are created in the image of God, and therefore all have worth and value. You also affirm heaven awaits you. Amen? That we'll be in his presence forevermore. With that, though, if you're a fundamentalist, you also affirm there's a place called hell. And that should move you to try and reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You also know as a Christian that he's given us his law, so we know what is right and what is wrong. We don't get to make it up. He's told us. It's not about consensus of the masses. As well as his Holy Spirit to guide us in those areas where he's not been specific. And history, it has a purpose. From beginning to end, the purpose of all things is to do what? Glorify God. This is the purpose. Now, having said all of that, I am persuaded that after it's all said and done, there are only really two worldviews. There is the one worldview that I trust all of you affirm, and then everybody else is in the other worldview. As I understand it, these two, and by the way, I would say this because based upon Scripture, I know a couple things to be true. I know, number one, that everybody knows that there is a God. The heavens declare it. They will deny it, but everybody knows there is a God. So you can't be atheistic, nor polytheistic. There is but one God, and the heavens declare this. Secondly, it's encoded in the heart of everyone, no matter how much given over to sin, the notion of right and wrong. And as I've said before, I think people, by and large, their definition is you can do whatever you want to do, everything's okay, unless it harms me, that's when it becomes wrong. But there is still, even as they suppress the truth and unrighteous, this basic idea. So the two camps are this. There is either the me-centered worldview in which it's all about me and my happiness. And that's where, by and large, everyone is. I remember when our oldest was born. And I say this because all of us tend to do this. All of us tend to kind of gravitate towards the me-centered worldview. When our oldest was born, my father-in-law said, did you just feel that? And I said, what? He said, did you feel the center of the universe shift? And unfortunately, that is oftentimes the way we think. Wherever we are, that is the center of the universe. The other one is the God-centered worldview, in which it's all about God and all for His glory. Can I get an amen on that? Now, as Christians, growing in His Word, rightly understanding doctrine, we are God-centered. And I would say further, only Christians who truly seek the Lord can be God-centered. There are some so-called Christians who flirt with the idea, but they are still very me-centered. You alone can know the one true God. That being said, every one of us here would say, I'm God-centered. But within five minutes of now, we will slip in and out of that God-centered worldview. Even in this next hour, as we're looking at God's Word, write it down, you will have thoughts you will think about things that will shift from honoring Christ to focusing on yourself. And, and I was thinking to myself, wouldn't it be nice if there was this an internal alarm that went off when that happened as Christians? Not that anybody else could hear it, but that it just shook us, you know? And suddenly we knew we were heading down that wrong path. Now, Lord willing, we will be more often than not focused on Jesus Christ and be God-centered. But it is a struggle. It is a struggle. Because this flesh, the old dead man, is hungry. And the old dead man constantly desires to be fed from the cesspool of sin. And I think the, the longer you're, you know the Lord, the more you grow in His grace, the more you understand how deep of a struggle there is within. Again, can I get a soft amen on that? I mean, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. It's just always right there, and it is indeed a struggle. So 
We've got to keep our eyes on Christ, and this should be our desire. So we need regular teaching from God's Word. We need His Holy Spirit to illuminate us, to understand truth, and we need His Spirit to convict us of sin and righteousness. The passage we look at today is going to remind us of our need of Him, His truth, the need of His Holy Spirit, as we consider what it means to be great in the kingdom of God. I'll give you an overview of the passage, and then we're going to get into it, and we'll move rather rapidly today. We're going to see, first of all, the path of suffering, and this is in reference to Jesus, His path of suffering. And then we're going to look at the need of the Holy Spirit. Then we'll touch on the problem of pride. Then we'll talk about the need of humility. And finally, the purpose of all things. So this morning, I'd invite you, if you've got your Bibles ready to go, let's look at Luke chapter 9. If I invite you to stand with me now for the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 9, verse 43. Hear now the word of the Lord. And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. But while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them, so that they did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be the greatest. And Jesus, notice the singularity here, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him by him and said to them, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all will be great. Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. The Gennaris family is passing through from one military base to another, and Jason, I'd like to ask you to pray this morning as we look at God's Word. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, there's a detail that I want you to notice initially in verse 43 before we get too deep into this passage. Do you recall previously last week what took place? Jesus was transfigured. There were three disciples who saw that. Then they came down the mountain, and what happened? Jesus healed a boy possessed of a demon. Now, notice what Luke records here in verse 43 as it relates to the crowd. And they were what? All amazed at what? The majesty of God. And what was this in particular? But while everyone marveled at all the things that Jesus did. I want you to notice that the crowd at the very least had an understanding. They were amazed at the majesty of God seeing what Jesus did. They made a connection. They didn't fully understand who he was, but there was at least some connection at this point early on that Jesus was operating in the very power of God. Now that being said, Jesus' mission was not simply to astonish people. He didn't come here to wow us. He came here to save sinners. And this is where we go now in verse 44. And while they were all amazed at the majesty of God, verse 43 but while everyone marveled at all the things that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these words sink down deep into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. It's important for us to understand the plan of salvation is more than the fact that Jesus was betrayed. Not only was he betrayed, but he had to die to atone for our sins and rise from the dead for our justification. There's two parallel passages that's going to help us today. Go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew records the same events, and Mark does as well. And we're going to turn to each one of them. Matthew, first of all, right now. And I want you to notice that Matthew records this important part that Jesus both had to die and rise from the dead. Matthew 17, I'm down in verse 22. 
And in context, if you have a study Bible, you'll probably see somewhere the word transfiguration at the top of your Bible. But I'm in verse 22, the same context here. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. So there's the parallel idea, right? Notice this next part though. They will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up. And notice the response. They were exceedingly sorrowful. So Matthew records both the death and resurrection. The death of Jesus Christ is essential. I'm going to use a big word for atonement, for atonement. Jesus had to die to pay for our sins, to redeem us out of bondage. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ is essential for justification. What's justification? The fact that God declares the sinner both forgiven and righteous. And if Christ did not rise from the dead, we could not be forgiven and declared righteous. In order to save us, Jesus first and foremost had to be a perfect sacrifice. But he also had to die. Because without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins, there can be no forgiveness. But he also had to rise from the dead, not only for our justification to be declared righteous, but to prove he was indeed God. If he did not rise from the dead, he was not God, and he would not be a sufficient sacrifice. We could not have righteousness imputed to us. We'd have no standing with God. We'd still be dead in our sins and trespasses. There's your theological nugget for the day. Let's continue on. As Christians, we look not only to Calvary, but to the empty tomb, right? And for these two events, we're going to praise God for all eternity. But again, at the end of verse 23 here, notice what Matthew said about the crowd. Or excuse me, about uh, verse 23 again. Look at this, what he said. Um, and they were exceedingly sorrowful, those who were with Jesus Christ at this time. The question would be raised is why? Why were they sorrowful? Well, this gets into our worldview again. At this particular point, they did not understand why Jesus had come. They thought, again, this is just the coming king. We're going to set up shop and off we go. Let's go back to Luke 9, and we're going to see this more specifically as we see our need of the Spirit. Luke chapter 9, now in verse 45. Notice what he says there, but they did not understand this saying. It was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Again, they were stuck in the temporal. They didn't understand the eternal. They thought Jesus was going to set up the kingdom, take over Rome, defeat it, establish the earthly prosperity of Israel again. And this will become more evident in verse 46, because we're going to see that their struggle, their concern was about greatness in the kingdom. But verse 45 is also important to us, because it reminds us of our need of the Holy Spirit. They did not understand it. It was hidden from them. You say, wait a minute, Jesus just told them. How can it be hidden? Because there's a difference between revelation and illumination. They heard the truth. They knew what was going to take place, but they didn't understand it. God doesn't play games with us. But there are times when certain truths are hidden from us because he knows how to develop us to become more and more Christ-like. And I'm sure all of you have experienced this again, where you've heard truth before, it didn't make any sense. Then later on, it's like, wow, now I get it. But the last phrase is also important in verse 45. So they didn't understand it, but what did they do? They didn't ask for an explanation. They were afraid to ask about the saying. Now, it'd be really easy for us in this passage to look down upon the disciples. They don't understand it. They don't ask for help. Furthermore, they're struggling with who's the greatest in the kingdom. So we can look down upon them, but I would say all of us are in the same boat apart from the grace of God. So let's not look down upon them. But I would say this, let's ask for help if we don't understand truth. We should ask God especially to disclose to us by his spirit to work so that we might understand what's going on. Go to James chapter one. James chapter one. I bet a lot of our young folks have memorized this portion of James. James chapter one, you know how it begins, right? After James introduces himself. He says, my brethren, count it what? All joy when you do what? Various trials. We're supposed to count it all joy when we're struggling. I had a brother come up to me today and say, you know what? I've been talking to my family about the need for us to be thankful. Even during this time when it is crazy and confusing to be thankful because God is still good. And James says, listen, when you're going through hard times, you be thankful. Now, what follows out of that is not some other snippet of truth. It is in line with what James is talking about. In the context of struggling with life, not knowing what's coming and going, what's going on, what are you supposed to do? First of all, count it all joy. 
But secondly, go to the Lord. Look at verse 5 and what he says. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So in the context of struggling with what's going on in life, count it all joy. I'm going to rejoice, Lord, but I'm going to come to you because I need to try and make sense of this. I don't understand what's going on. And so we ask of God. For, I had someone call me just this weekend. And this, again, this is one of those worldview things. How do I make sense of my world? We have God's word, but we also need to understand it. We need the spirit. This person called, and I'm telling you what, just going through a really, really rough time with relationships right now. And doing what I think is a great thing to do. Help me to understand what God's word says. How do I navigate well through this? And I'll tell you what, there's not always easy answers, are there? But we need to come to God. We need to ask God, give us wisdom. But also, like this person did, ask trusted Bible teachers, individuals who devote themselves to the study of God's Word, to reconciling truth, to help us make sense of what's going on. How many of you have a life's verse here, a verse that you go to? I don't know that I necessarily have one, but vocationally there is one that's an anchor point for me. Go with me to Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7. Now, you're going to struggle to find the book of Ezra. Start in Genesis and work your way. Get about halfway to Psalms, and you'll find Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, those little books there. I remember hearing this verse back in Bible school, and I said, this is it. This is the anchor verse for vocational ministry. This is what it's all about. Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10. I love this comment about God's servant here. Ezra 7, 10. And any of you who are seeking to be teachers of God's word, let this resonate in your mind as how to approach it. Look at this, Ezra 7.10, For Ezra had prepared his heart to do what? To seek the law of the Lord. I want to know his truth. But what's next is extremely important. And to do it. You might be the greatest teacher, but if number one, you don't know the word of God, and if you're not living it, you have no business teaching it. It is of the utmost importance that it first be lived out in the life of a teacher, and then to teach the statutes and ordinances in Israel. You know, I, I am more impressed with faithful pastors in small rural churches who day in and day out study God's Word and try and live it out in their body of believers and in their community, and in turn, lovingly teach it with simplicity through the years to those who gather in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those two people, to me, are worthy of great reward in heaven. Not the big box church pastors, who their whole time is devoted to their presentation, but those who are diligent in the study of God's Word to live it and to teach it. Now, with that being said, I want to provide a warning really quickly. Be careful to whom you listen to on the radio and who you watch on the television. Not all so-called pastors or teachers truly love the Lord, His Word, and the people of God. And I was thinking maybe it would be helpful just to have a way to think about this. We've got people coming and going, looking for new church homes as they move away from here. Uh, but not just that, but again on the radio or on the TV. Number one, who are they promoting? Who are they promoting? Are they promoting themselves or Jesus Christ? There's a good first question. That's probably almost enough, isn't it? Number two, what are they offering? What are they offering? Temporal blessings or eternal blessings? truths, and blessings. Number three, what are they requesting? What do they want? Do they want your money, your allegiance, or are they looking for you to be committed to your local church for corporate worship and for serving fellow believers and your local community for reaching the lost? And number four, what is their worldview? Are they self-centered or God-centered? Which takes us back to our passage now. Let's go back to Luke again now and look at the problem of pride. And again, let's silently confess and agree we all struggle with this. So as we get in and look at the disciples again, let's not give them a hard time. Let's acknowledge we'd be right there with them as well in Luke chapter 9 and verse 46. And look again, the clarity here of this me-centered worldview. Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be greatest. And again, <laughs> apart from the grace of God... <laughs> we'd all be right there with them. What I want you to be mindful of, well, I'll ask it, I'll do it this way. Do you think this was a short conversation? 
Do you think there was like two comments? Or do you think this was like a 10 minute, a 20 minute, a one hour or a five hour conversation? Let's go to Mark now. A little bit more context here. If I understand it correctly, this was a rather lengthy discussion that they had, a dispute. Mark chapter 9, and I'm in verse 31 now. And again, you'll see the same context. We're in the same, the same event here. Verse 31, and he, speaking about Jesus, taught his disciples, said to them, the Son of Man is being betrayed in the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. Same context. But they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. Then he came to Capernaum. So there's been a travel taking place here. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it you were disputed? What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? <laughs> in my mind, I can just see this. They're traveling, right? They've gotten into the big family van. And instead of playing I Spy or watching Veggie Tales or singing praise songs, they're disputing with one another who's the greatest. You can you just hear this, right, going on. I think this gives us context, doesn't it? They did not understand the mission of Jesus. And again, this is why they were saddened. They wanted, when Jesus set up his earthly kingdom, to be right there in the position of prominence. And again, we know this because this dispute did not end on this particular occasion. I think it would have been enough, right? But shortly thereafter, we got the same thing going on. Go to Mark chapter 10 and go to verse 35. Mark 10 and verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. There's a big request. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And keep in mind, in the previous passage, he discerned the thought, the intent, the purpose of their heart. So he's not asking a question for information. He's saying, let's come out with it. Go ahead and say whatever it is. And they said to him, grant us that we may sit <clears throat> one on your right hand and the other on your left in glory. Now, later today, you can read into this passage a little bit deeper. Jesus says, you have no idea what you're asking for. No idea whatsoever. But it wasn't just the two of them. Look at verse 41. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. Why? Because they got to Jesus before they did. They're all thinking the same thing. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So we're dealing with the issue of pride. Now let's go back to Luke, because I want you to see in our context here, Jesus immediately deals with this issue of pride. And he does initially directly, but secondly, with a, a reminder of the purpose of all things. So he deals with, first of all, the need for humility. And again, this is in keeping with Jesus, who didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Not just to serve, but to die to save sinners. So the need of humility, back in Luke 9, now verses 47 and 48. Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him by him. And they said to them, he said to them, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all will be great. So Jesus is saying, receive the least. It's not enough. It's not sufficient for us to feel bad for people. We have to receive one another. And this is a demonstration when we do this that our faith is like that of a child. So I feel like every now and then I should be allowed to give a paw update. So I'm going to do one right now. So uh, we're up to three grandsons, and we're doing great. My wife and I, we are designed to be grandparents, so this is really good for us. And the two youngest are, what, are they about two months old now, something like that? Three months old. Okay, that's why. So this is why, this is why I'm so blessed. My wife has the details that I can never remember, some of which I asked to write down today so I could be mindful of certain things. By the way, the two youngest ones are doing great. 
They are as cute as can be. And if you wonder if that's true, just ask me. I'll show you pictures, okay? So everything's going great. But our oldest uh, grandson just turned two years old. And so this was a big event. Um, we're talking about gifts. At two years old, he knows how to open them up. He understands what we're doing with the gifts. Now, that's important because um, last weekend, he was at our house. It was our anniversary. He came over to see Paul and Gigi. And so that was great. Got some good snuggles. That was really a blessing. But there was a fellow in our church who came over to drop off a vehicle that he had borrowed. And so our grandson's talking to this fella. And, and our grandson recognizes that he must be here for a special event. And so he says to him, I have present for you. And our grandson walks over down the hall where there's a gift lying on the floor, picks it up and brings it back over to this fella. And, and, I was, and so this was like, wow. First of all, he recognized there was a gift laying around. I mean, this was just a blessing to my heart, right? So he saw a gift, but he didn't assume it was for him, which I thought was pretty cool. And he wanted to bless somebody else. And I thought that was really sweet. And by the way, right now, he's at the stage where everybody's his friend. If you see him, be my friend, my friend. And what he will ask you to do is play trains right now. All right? So just be prepared. That's a big event. So the gift went back in the hallway because it wasn't for this fella. And as they were getting ready to go, I think someone said, I think one of his parents said, tell Paul and Gigi happy anniversary. And so he says, happy anniversary. I have a present for you. I get it. He goes and gets the same gift, not for himself, but for us. Isn't that sweet? I think it's all reflection of Paul, right? No, no, it's just, it's nothing, nothing other than the grace of God. I mean, what a sweet, you think it's of Gigi? Uh, I know, it's humility. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go back to the Bible. <laughs> I mean, you know, again, apart from the grace of God, he, he's just a selfish sinner like all of us who would have thought, this is for me. I get to enjoy this. But, but this is what Jesus is touching on, that childlike notion of seeing someone else as more important than yourself. And, and Luke is focused on this idea. Once, he wants us to understand this, that we need to consider those who are overlooked, lesser in society, and sometimes honestly disrespected. You know, I was asked, are you going to try and rebuild now that we've identified all the problems in our society? Absolutely. And Luke is going to, the gospel of Luke helps us to do this, to recognize we need to be a people who receive others, not just invite, not just welcome, but receive. And, and you know the difference, invite, come, be part of this body of faith. That's a good thing. And when someone shows up, we're so glad you're here. It's wonderful. But to receive goes much deeper, and, and, and we've seen it already. We're going to see it again. To receive someone is to say, not only do I see you, but I'm going to ask you a question. What do you need? And it's not just a question because I want information. It's a question because if you have a need and if I have it, guess what? It's yours. And if I don't have it, then I'm going to work with you in order to obtain it because you have a need. That's what it means to receive someone. And we're going to see this, especially when we talk about the Good Samaritan. Not just willing to go, oh, wow, you got problems here. Okay, see you later. God bless you. But I'm going to take care of you because if you, if you need it and I have it, I'm going to do that. And I want you to notice here in this passage, Jesus did not say what you need to do is figure out who is least. That's not what he said. He said you need to become the least. For us as Christians, it's not about saying, ranking and stacking people and saying, well, they're doing okay, or they're not doing very good. That's not it. For us as Christians to say, I am going to become little, I'm going to become the least and serve you. Because that's what Jesus has done. That's what he calls me to do. And you'll also notice that he says, whoever receives one of these little ones, how? In my name. Which now gets us into the purpose of all things. And we'll pick it up now in verses 49 and 50 here. Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. Again, I don't think it's a mistake twice in these verses, in my name. This is worldview stuff. All for God and for his glory. That's what it's all about. And the statement here is of ultimate purpose, all for his glory. And in that, there is no competition. We're not going around saying, well, look at what they're doing over there. Well, we got to compete with them. No, no, the kingdom of God is not divided like that. 
If it is done in his name, then we want to give God praise for that. Praise be to God. All of it, not a competition. And again, in my opinion, this is in line with my position that there are two worldviews. It's supported in this passage. There's no middle ground. You are either one side or the other. You're either for God or against him. You're either self-centered or God-centered. So let's, let's wrap this thing up with some questions. If it's okay, I'd like to challenge each of us today with a recognition that we all slip into that me-centered worldview, but how are we doing overall? And you can evaluate yourself here. Would you say that you spend the bulk of your time seeking to make yourself happy? Would you say that's how you spend the bulk of your time? And again, let's just, I think the older we grow, the more we recognize the struggle within, because it can be as something as simple as a piece of cake. That's going to make me happy. And so I'm not going to have one piece, I'm going to have two. And suddenly we lack moderation. We lack just the simplicity of discipline of enough to be pleasing, but actually at times entering the sin, even over food. And I did find as of late, I enjoy the taste of food. I, when I was younger, it was about eating for energy so I could do the next thing. Now I enjoy food. So now I have to be careful. I have to be mindful of that. Or do you find, as I'm going to start to develop this theme, do you find Jesus lovely? Do you find him as beautiful? That he's not, the, not only the ultimate source, but he is the recipient of your highest affections because you desire him above all things. Are you looking to promote yourself? Are you looking for prominence in some earthly organization? Are you desirous of more power, or I should add to that, even more money in order to get what you want to please yourself? Do you seek his wisdom in his word and through prayer? Do you notice those who are overlooked, the outcast, the disrespected? The more challenging question is, do you seek to care for them? How much are you willing to give up? Boy, there's a tough question right there, isn't it? How much would you lay at the, at the cross in order to share the gospel with someone else who doesn't know Jesus Christ? Is there anything you wouldn't be willing to give up? Are you living for his glory, doing all in his name? And the last question, are you willing to suffer? If God calls you to suffer in following the Savior, again, that another believer might be strengthened or another hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, are you willing to suffer? Which brings us to our highest example, our Savior himself. He was determined to bring glory to his Father through saving sinners, and he came to serve, not to be served. And, and I want you to notice verse 51 here in our, in our passage. Everything up until this point has been preparatory, and there is a major shift in the Gospel of Luke in verse 51 here, because suddenly the focus, the attention is going to shift for a particular mission that Jesus had to be obedient to his father. Verse 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to receive, be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He knew what was ahead, and that was where he was going. It was time now to go to Jerusalem. I had someone last, uh, say last week, that I said something, I think, rather disturbing, rather profound, and I hope not prophetic. I said that if, if the foundations of our society continue to be destroyed, it's just a matter of time until we are going to suffer like we never suffered as Christians in this nation. And, and with that, I know a lot of people, their concern would be, is how do we prepare for such a thing? I would say the ultimate preparation is to seek the Lord. And I say that because in that hour, resources will dwindle no matter how much you have. But in that hour, those who truly love the Lord will be manifest and we'll find out whether or not we truly love one another. The call of God upon all of us, whether we like it or not, includes suffering. And we can do that with bitterness or we can do it with joy. We can do it with a self-centered, me-centered worldview in which we are frustrated, mad, and angry at God. 
And we count all things as why. Why in the world have I done all of this if this is what I get in life? Or we view it all for the glory of God. And folks, I would say something just real quick in passing. This touches on everything in life. It, it touches on not only how do we deal with COVID and how do we bring glory to God. It deals with also when you get that phone call from a good friend and you know it's going to be a long conversation and maybe a visit to go and serve them. Or you get that phone call from a doctor. Or you're just trying to get out in traffic. And you know you better be seeking the Lord in that hour. Last night, I thought I was going to lose my salvation. I was trying to come to church on Saturday night to preach God's word, and I can't even get out on Green Mount. I mean, my goodness. The traffic flow, it's terrible. And I thought in that moment, you know, this is it. I'm going to give up right now. The Lord's example is what we must follow. But His example is more than that. Because He came not only to serve, he came to give his life a ransom for many. And all of us must be thankful and live a life of thankfulness for that great sacrifice for you and I, for you and me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word because it is rich and it is true. And we thank you for your spirit who takes these words from this page, this revelation from you and illuminates our hearts and our minds that we might understand it. But in that hour, Lord, we would also confess there is a sweetness and a degree of conviction that we experience, and we thank you for that. No discipline is enjoyable at the time, but afterwards it is fruitful and it yields righteousness, and for this we give you thanks. And Lord, we would ask that your spirit would be like that internal work of some sort of like an alarm that would just set off within us when we are wandering, when we are straying when we are again becoming selfish. Because Lord, as best we can discern, we want to honor you. You've placed that within us. You've given us a heart which beats and pants after you. So please make it a strong heart for you. Help us to see just how lovely, how beautiful you are. And we pray this in your precious son's name, Jesus, for your glory. Amen.